evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight, DuPont brings you The 18th Captain, a thrilling and authentic story of our Navy, with Ralph Bellamy playing the title role. The 18th Captain was written by Stuart Hawkins. Historical background is based upon the new biography, John Paul Jones by Lincoln Lorenz, published by the United States Naval Institute, Annapolis, Maryland. Presenting Ralph Bellamy in The 18th Captain on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. <laughs> L. Weeks, pharmacist mate, first class, United States Navy, awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for distinguished heroism in the Battle of the Coral Sea. Captain Paul Heineman, United States Navy, awarded the Legion of Merit for exceptionally meritorious service with North Atlantic convoys. Lieutenant William H. Gibbs, United States Navy, awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for heroism and extraordinary achievement in the Aleutian Islands campaign. Charles Kleinsmith, water tender, first class, United States Navy, awarded the Navy Cross for extraordinary heroism and courageous devotion to duty in the Battle of Midway. Vice Admiral Henry K. Hewitt, United States Navy, awarded the Distinguished Service Medal for exceptionally meritorious service in the successful landings and occupation of objectives in French Morocco. Carl C., the North Atlantic, Aleutian Islands, Midway, Africa. Today, the terse citations come literally from all around the world. We thrill to them, of course. But there is one man who would hear them with even deeper satisfaction, if by some miracle he still could listen. He sensed our Navy's destiny and fought for it, even before we had a Navy. His name was Jones. 164 years ago in Philadelphia... There's no purpose in attempting the impossible. Edith, if we can't afford nothing, let's go. Uh, yes, we might as well have probably had 100,000. Gentlemen, please. I have a letter from General Washington. We're still holding General Howe penned up in Boston. Let's not stray from the point, Adams. We're the Naval Committee, not the Military Committee. I'm not straying from the point, as you will see. General Washington says here, I have fitted out several privateers and have high hopes they will bring in some merchant ships as prizes. That's the answer to our problem, gentlemen. Privateers, sir. They're no answer to anything. Costs us nothing to give them the commissions. They're the only naval force we can afford. Uh, come in. Mr. Hughes, here. Yeah. Oh, John, come in. Come in. Joseph, I have you. Uh, gentlemen, this is my good friend, Mr. John Paul Jones from Fredericksburg, Virginia. Mr. Adams of Massachusetts. Adams, yes. Sir. Stephen Hopkins of Rhode Island. Uh, sir. John Langdon of New Hampshire. Uh, Robert Morris of Philadelphia. You do, sir. And Lee, you know. Gentlemen, the town of Falmouth, Maine, has been attacked and burned to the ground. What? what? No, news just it. came. Three enemy ships, a 60-gun frigate, and two smaller ones, anchored in a harbor and shelled the town at leisure. Oh. There's not a house left standing. Yes, it is. The town was defenseless. And so is every other town along our coast, until we organize a navy to defend them. We were just discussing the possibility of relying on privateers, John. Privateers? They're only good to play on merchantmen. They got stand up the ships of the line. Why not? They were armed heavily enough? Because there'd be no profit in it. Frigates can only be defeated by men who are fighting for the continental cause, not for prize money. I'm afraid this interruption has lasted long enough, Mr. Jones. It's grateful to you for bringing us this news that the committee must make its own decision. Mr. Adams, I've been a sailor since I was 12. And I've been captain of my own ship since I was 19. If I've spoken too freely, it's only because I know we cannot win this war without a Navy. Your pardon, gentlemen. Good day. Good day. Good day. Personally, I agree with Jones completely. A captain at 19, was he? Oh, we could use men like him, I think. Who is he? Where is he from? He was born in Scotland. His brother settled in Fredericksburg some years ago, and John now makes his home there. I like his spirit. And I must say, Adams, there's good logic in everything he said. Well, John, it's finally settled. Which way, right or wrong? There will be a continental navy. The right way. Thank heaven. How many ships? Five. Only five? How big are they? The Alfred will have 30 guns, the Columbus 28, the Andrew Doria 16, the Cabot 14, and a little sloop Providence will mount 12. Mm. <laughs> Perhaps there's been a smaller Navy than that sometime in history, but I doubt it. <laughs> well, we'll just have to make it do. Uh, you are to receive a commission as a lieutenant, John. A lieutenant? 
But the four captain commissions went to men who have lived here longer than you have, John. But as the highest ranking lieutenant on the list, you can have the command of the Providence if you want. The 12 gun sloop, no thanks. Hmm? I don't want it. In heaven's name, why not? We're all new with the business of war, Joseph. The Alfred with 30 guns will carry the brunt of the fighting. I'll learn faster on her than anywhere. Mm. Very well, John. You'll be first mate on the Alfred, and until Captain Saltonstall arrives from Boston, you'll be acting captain as well. you're doing, Lieutenant? Oh, you're Captain Saltonstall. I am. Welcome aboard, sir. We expected you to take command several days ago. I was delayed on the way. What is it you're doing with these men? Gun drills, sir. You're wasting precious powder and practice drills? No, sir. We're not using actual powder or shot. The men simply go through the motions of loading and pointing the gun. Is this one of Commodore Hopkins' ideas? Oh, sure, it's my own idea. Oh, I see. Well, the men don't seem to enjoy this game of play acting as much as you do. They're grumbling a bit now, sir, but they'll thank me for it when we meet the enemy. We may have fewer guns than a ship of the line, but we'll be able to fire faster and truer than they expect. Uh, Mr. Hughes, Commodore Hopkins writes that as a result of Lieutenant Jones' gunnery and the engagement with the Glasgow... He has promoted Lieutenant Jones to captain's rank and has given him command of the Providence. Fine, fine. I told you we should have made him a captain in the first place, Robert. Well, perhaps it's better this way. He leaves a well-drilled crew on the Alfred and will now train the men on the Providence the same way. So we shall have two fighting crews, at least. Of course, of course. Uh, this is Captain Jones of the Sloop Providence. Mm-hmm. He's not been in Philadelphia since you became head of the Naval Committee. Mm. Pleasure to meet you, Captain Jones. An honor, Mr. Hancock. Captain Jones has just convoyed several coal ships down from Boston. And since the Commodore gave him no definite orders for the future, he's hoping the committee will see fit to do so. Mm. <laughs> I'm afraid we have no convoys that need escorting at the moment. Convoying isn't what I have in mind, Mr. Hancock. So? What kind of orders would you like? The only kind that'll do any good. Orders to cruise up and down the coast and attack enemy ships wherever and whenever I can find them. In the Providence? Alone, Captain? Better to attack alone than not at all, Mr. Morris. Hmm. Except for our one engagement with a glass door, we've been fighting a defensive war. So the enemy supply convoys come in with one or at the most two escort ships. Give me authority to cruise at will and I can play drakes with them. But uh, what if you run into a 60-gun frigate while you're playing drake? I'll either outfight it or outsail it. Don't you see? We must attack. We're so weak, we can't do anything else. We must fight as a carrier fights a bull, dashing in and out, snapping at his heels, worrying him, harassing him until for peace he moves into a quieter path. Well, for a fighting man, Captain Jones, you turn a graphic phrase. Yes, and a sound one. Well, we'll let you try it, Captain. I'll draw up the order permitting you to cruise as you see fit. <laughs> to report, sir, that in the seven weeks of my cruise, I have captured and sent in eight prize ships, and I've sunk eight more enemy vessels. Splendid, Captain Jones. Splendid. I think the terrier has worried the bull in notable fashion, eh, Hancock? <laughs> A little more of that, and we may hear him bellow. Oh, by the way, Captain, I've been holding something for you. Here. It's your new commission. A new commission? Yes. Now that we have declared our independence... Congress has replaced the original commissions in the Continental Navy with new and proper ones in the Navy of the United States. Thank you, sir. Is there some mistake here, Mr. Hancock? Mistake? 
Uh, well, well, this seems to place me as the 18th captain in line of rank. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> that's, that's right. When I was appointed a senior lieutenant in the Continental Navy, there were only four captains ahead of me. On the basis of simple seniority, I should stand fifth in the new list. Yes, I know, I know, I know, Jones. But <laughs> when politics enters in, uh, seniority is never simple politics. And this new list was made up by the whole committee, you understand, Captain. And I assure you, there were times when it seemed every mother's son in Congress had 14 brothers who must be made captain. I see. Well, whether I'm 18th or 1st is only important as it affects my chances of getting a larger ship. I've done what I could with the Providence, but it's, it's not a tenth of what must be done. Oh, planning another cruise already, huh? <laughs> well, if you can do as well the second time as you've done now, you no need for a larger ship, Captain. Oh, yes, I have, sir. This time I want to cross the Atlantic and carry the offensive to the enemy's own doorstep. What's that? Cross the Atlantic? The only sensible thing to do, sir. The enemy hasn't felt this war as yet. We must make him feel it where it'll hurt. Strike at his own port as he has struck at ours. Attack him in his own home waters, where his whole fleet could be after you in no time? That doesn't mean they'd get me, Mr. Morris. Oh, Captain Jones, you're mad. It's an impossible idea. That's what the enemy thinks, Mr. Hancock. Any plan which the enemy thinks improbable has an excellent chance of success. I don't know. The only way we can keep him from sending more ships over here. His fleet, his home fleet, is thinned out already. If I start raiding along his coast, he'll not dare weaken it further. He may even have to call some frigates back to try and catch me there. Oh, it's a wild scheme. Yes, uh, Hancock, can you see the possible effect of a bold stroke like that on France? If successful, it might swing them into open alliance. If successful, I tell you, it will be successful. Just give me a proper ship. Hmm. Proper ship? Hmm. Well, uh, Dr. Franklin has been doing good work for us in Paris, Captain Jones. His last letter reports that the French are secretly building a new frigate, Xinjiang, which they will turn over to us when it's finished. New frigate, eh? Huh? Such a ship operating from a friendly base in France, I couldn't say. Mm, the Indian will be finished in the fall. If you can go to France in the Providence, say, at the end of October, Captain Jones. In the Providence? I think that would be ruinous, sir. Huh? Uh, what do you mean? Do you think France would be willing to give a new first-line frigate to a captain who arrives in a made-over fishing boat? They'll judge America by me, and they'll judge me by the ship I arrive in. Must be something better than the Providence. <laughs> He's full of common sense, Hancock. Somehow, uh, we must find a ship more worthy of him. Not more worthy of me, Mr. Morris. The United States. Welcome to Paris, Captain Jones. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. My friends and I have been awaiting your arrival. The uh, Comtesse uh, de la Vendale. May I present Captain Jones of the United States Navy? You have come a long way. We are glad you are here, Captain Jones. You are kind, Countess. And this is Monsieur Levé de Chaumont, who has arranged for this very comfortable roof over my aging head. Uh, welcome, Captain. Uh, your countryman, Monsieur Loring, tells us that you are coming when he arrived day before yesterday with the good news that they're going to surrender. I'm sorry, I'm not the first to bring that news, but I stopped to capture two prize ships on the way over. No. You capture two ships? But well, that is an achievement in itself. Wait till I tell that at court. He apologized for being late, but stopped to capture two prizes on the way. <laughs> it will make a better introduction to the king than if you had been on time, Captain Jones. Much better. Yeah, I hope right. it'll make him see that the Indian is completed quickly. Hey, Dr. Franklin? The Indian, Jones, is a lost hope, so far as we are concerned. What do you mean? Our enemies sift out the truth. And the king dares not offend him by giving us that ship now. He would if he could, Captain. But after all, France is supposedly neutral. You understand. Is there any chance of getting me another ship? Well, uh, this must be handled delicately. Don't look so downcast, Captain Jones. With time and tact and talk, nothing is ever impossible. What do you mean by time? Oh, six months, perhaps. Six months? What am I supposed to do in the meantime? Mm, Paris is a charming city, Captain. You are undeniable proof of that, Countess. But I didn't come abroad to be charmed. I came to fight. Without a ship, we can only suggest patience. No, Doctor. I came over on the Ranger. Since there's nothing better, I'll fight with her. Isn't she too small for what you intend, Captain? Loring told me she has with 18 guns. That's right. Only 18 nine-pounders. And she's slower than she should be and cranky in a headwind. But if she's all we've got... I'll have to make her do. 
You are listening to The 18th Captain, starring Ralph Bellamy as John Paul Jones on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. The disappointing news that France could not provide him with a powerful frigate did not stop Captain Jones. Turning his back on Paris, he hurried aboard the little sloop of war ranger that had brought him across the Atlantic. As our play continues, we hear him preparing for action. Back aboard so soon, Captain? Yes, Lieutenant. Cancel all shore leave for the crew. We work ahead hard work. How's that, sir? I want the mainmast removed and placed three feet aft of its present position. All three topmasts shortened. After that, we'll careen ship and clean the bottom. When that's done, we'll see about adding extra ballast. We've got to get more speed out of it. But, sir, that's... I know. It's a large order. But since no one else will help us, we'll help ourselves. Doctor, Doctor Franklin. You see this, almost? Uh, Have you heard the news, Doctor? What news, Comtesse? Oh, c'est magnifique. Oh, c'est incroyable. Dear me, what is it? Has the Queen become a mother again? Huh? The Queen? Oh, no, no, no. It is your captain, your uh, Jean Paul Jones. Jean Paul, a mother? You staggered me, monsieur. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> Doctor. He. Yeah. They're pouring burn vessels at the dock. Yes. Yeah. And the sloop of war they sent out after him, he waited for and met and captured it. Oh. Yes, the ranger and the captured warship arrived in Brest last night. Blended. Oh, it is unbelievable. It is miraculous. Not at all, monsieur. After all, he is captain in the United States Navy. Oh, Doctor, if all your captains are like Jean Paul, I could wish I lived in America. It would do you no good, madame. For if all our captains were like Jean Paul, they would always be at sea fighting. <laughs> you are right. And now, my friends, we must try to persuade the king that Jean Paul could use a larger ship to even greater advantage, eh? Well, Dr. Franklin. Sit down, John Paul. Sit down. Eight months. Eight months of talk. Still no ship. Eight months and at last the ship. Ah. What's that? Say it again. The king will buy the Dura. She's yours. The Dura? You remember her? Of course I remember her. She's far from perfect. Six 18-pounders, 28 12s, and the rest 9-pounders. Do <laughs> you think she'll do? She'll have to do, sir. But with one change. Yes? When we raise the American flag in her, she will, with your permission, sir, become the Bonhomme Richard. Well, since it is the captain and not the name of the ship which wins battles, do as you wish, John Paul. <laughs> Merchant fleet, all right, sir. Thirty-nine. Forty. Forty-one merchant ships and two ships of war. Can you make out what that larger one is, Lieutenant Dale? I'd recognize her anywhere, sir. She's a set up. Fifty guns. Fifty? We'd best take care of her first. Well, our two French ships out of sight as usual. Paris is way to the south there. And the Alliance. There she is. All down on the right. We can't wait for them to catch up. We'll attack alone, Mr. Dale. Stand by to come about. Stand by to come about. Lively there. Man the weather sheet. Bosun, pipe all hands to battle stations. Aye, aye, sir. All hands to battle stations. Yes, Mr. Dale. Our light guns become more effective with every yard we gain. What is this? The longer he asks questions, the closer we shall get to him, Mr. Dale. Yes, sir. I can't hear what you say. What is this? I'm not going to get this shot down, sir. You dare not longer. Just a little longer, Mr. Dale. I'm sure. I can open fire. What is, is that? The 
Hey, hey, hey. Hoist our flag, Mr. Dale. Hey, hey, hey. Engine the lock. Fire Gun ports open. Come in. Firing. <laughs> Franklin, when the whole world will respect that flag. Thank you, Ralph Bellamy. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Mr. Bellamy will return to our microphone. Before we hear from him... We have a story of how chemistry now makes it possible to rivet planes with radio waves. Most warplanes have metal bodies, skins, as plane designers call them, that are held on by tiny metal rivets. A single plane needs thousands of rivets, and many of them must be used in tight corners where only one riveter can work, and where the rivet can be reached from only one side. Fortunately, when America got into the war and we suddenly had to build planes by the thousands faster than American ingenuity had ever built them before... DuPont had already perfected an ingenious rivet that doesn't need a helper to get at the other end. It's small, as airplane rivets are, smaller than a button. In one end, there is an even smaller explosive charge that's sensitive to heat. When the charge is fired, it expands the end of the rivet and forms a perfect head, shaped like an acorn, which holds the sheets of aluminum tightly together. The advantage of using DuPont explosive rivets in cramped corners is that even a raw recruit in the industrial army, a man or woman new at the job, can set 15 or 20 of them in a minute, as against two to four a minute for what are known as blind rivets. But most amazing of all is the new technique of setting these chemical rivets with radio waves. Until recently, the one device for driving or setting them was an electrically heated iron with a silver alloy tip. With this iron, a workman goes along a row of rivets and touching them with a heated tip, pops them off one after another. This iron was and still is the best method for many types of work. 
However, for large-scale aircraft production, engineers of the Radio Corporation of America, working in cooperation with DuPont engineers, have developed a radio frequency rivet detonator. It gets its power from vacuum tubes, like those that are transmitting this program to you. With the new device, it is possible to hold a line of rivets in place with adhesive tape, and the radio wave will fire the charges one after another without burning the tape that holds the rivets. There's another new use for explosive rivets you'll want to hear about. A plane in North Africa, say, comes down out of the sky after a fight and lands on the desert with bullet holes in the wings. Sometimes just bullet holes, sometimes big rips and gashes where the metal skin has been torn away. DuPont explosive rivets enable the ground crew to do a speedy repair job on the spot. A patch of new metal can be riveted in place in just a few minutes using explosive rivets. Explosive rivets and the part of the technical know-how that developed the new radio frequency riveting tool are wartime contributions of the experts who bring you in time of peace to plant better things for better living through chemistry. And now the star of tonight's program, Ralph Bellamy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to have played the great American naval hero, John Paul Jones, on tonight's cavalcade. I think it's interesting in connection with our play to note the news item which came out of London last week. According to this report, the women of Yorkshire, England, have made an oak plaque together with a copy of the original flag in honor of John Paul Jones, which they plan to present to the American naval commander in Europe. It's offered in tribute to the stars and stripes lost in the battle between the Bonhomme Richard and the Serapis. And the inscription concludes with the words, quote, May this emblem ever inspire seamen with those virtues of honor displayed by both ship's companies that day. Unquote. Thank you. With the approval and cooperation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Cavalcade will present next week an original radio play, A Case for the FBI. Our star will be Edward G. Robinson. If, like most people, you believe that the FBI is only concerned with the detection of saboteurs and the lining up of criminal gangs, you are in for a surprise. Be sure to listen to Cavalcade next Monday. Edward G. Robinson is our star in a new radio play, A Case for the FBI. The orchestra and musical score on tonight's program were under the direction of Don Burry. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This program has come to you from New York. And this is the National Broadcasting Company.